All right, Bob, maybe we should head out. All right. Well, we'll get started then. Um, so we got some partners in uh, BioCT. Want to welcome everyone to this uh, third and final uh, session on developing and managing your biotech space needs. Um, on this rainy nor'easter day we're having here in Connecticut. I hope everyone's uh, staying safe and dry. I'm Bob Scalostra. I'm one of the partners and uh, lead lab planners uh, at Spiegel's and Partners Architects. And um, I don't know about you, but I've enjoyed uh, attending and participating in these uh, series that we've had. And, um, you know, we kind of took you through kind of the continuum of uh, biotechnology. We uh, kicked it off the first series with John Soderstrom from uh, Yale's Office of Cooperative Research talking about the uh, tech transfer and, and how that works and how successful Yale has been with that, um, with that uh, here in Connecticut. And, um, and uh, so that was exciting. And, and in that same session, we had various uh, uh, incubator facility operators including a new one that's coming to Connecticut bio labs will uh, be uh, be uh, in the 101 college building when that building opens so exciting stuff there and then in the second session we created this fictitious company uh, chem bio labs and we uh, kind of uh, took uh, took them through the process uh, what's involved in uh, designing as you kind of move out of that incubator and uh, we talked about programming and planning and and the various steps that are involved uh, we had various owners on and, and developers talking about uh, the different types of facilities and things to look for um, and I think this session is going to be just as exciting uh, because you're going to actually hear from the biotech companies themselves uh, today's topic is called uh, uh, lab space life cycle and lessons learned. And um, I think hearing from the biotechs themselves and what they've gone through and some of the things that they've learned uh, should be really beneficial. Um, today's moderator is Jay Brotman. And um, I've had the pleasure to work with Jay now for the last uh, 33 years. Yep, 33 years. I joined the company in 88. Jay joined the company a year before me in 87. So we've been working alongside each other for a while designing various uh, incubator, science technology and institutional research projects. Um, a couple notable things about Jay. Jay uh, was the principal and lead lab planner for the 55 Park Street, Yale New Haven Clinical uh, Health, uh, uh, Yale Clinical Laboratory Project that's right here in New Haven. And that building houses all the back of the house laboratories for Yale University or Yale Hospital as well as the pharmacy, the shipping and receiving, all that stuff comes in that building uh, underneath uh, South Frontage Road into the hospital. So that was a pretty exciting project. Another project of Jay's was Queens Mary College. That was an incubator facility in London, England that uh, Jay consulted on. And um, uh, that was pretty exciting for their first, very first incubator facility. Um, if you've worked with Jay on projects, you know he has uh, a, an attention to detail and he's really involved throughout the process, including really understanding the MEP systems. I'm sure we have some engineers that we've worked with on this today and, and they'll, uh, they'll probably vouch that Jay really does stay involved and really, uh, which I think is important for uh, science and technology projects. Um, trying to think of something that you don't know about Jay and, and, and what came to my mind was um, I think he has another calling. Uh, I watched him at our company outing this summer. We know that he likes to play golf or anyone that knows Jay, but he actually probably took more than half our office out to the driving range at Lyman Orchards and, and gave them instructions on how to swing a golf club. So, uh, uh, and that, and that, uh, so Jay, I think you have another calling in that. Um, all right, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Jay. Uh, thanks, Bob. Um, are you trying to get me out on the golf course? Is that what you're in the office? I'm not, I'm not quite sure I'd take one that. But watch with our office secrets. Uh, so anyway, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the third panel of our series focusing on laboratory space in the New Haven region. As Bob said, we're here to talk about lessons learned by those who have actually moved from incubator space or launched directly into their own laboratory environment. We have an unbelievable panel of people who have been through it all when it comes to building and operating lab facilities of all different types and sizes. Today, we'll get a peek into their processes and experiences. Uh, but before we do that, a little housekeeping. Uh, please keep your microphones on mute and select that speaker view uh, if possible. 
this will enable you to focus on the discussions as opposed to each other. Feel free to put questions in the chat as we will do Q&A towards the end. Also, the event is being recorded and will be shared in the next coming days, as well as stored on BioCT's video library, which can be found on their website. Now, I'm gonna have each of the panelists quickly introduce themselves before we have them tell you uh, a little more in depth about their laboratory uh, experiences and stories and journeys. So we are so pleased they are sharing their busy mornings with us. So first I'll turn it over to Jean Bertonis of Azitra. Thanks very much, Jay. Um, and let me start by saying, um, I, I've been on many panels and I want you to know that Jay is doing an excellent job of corralling us. <laughs> he is as detail oriented as Bob says he is. Um, I'm the chief operating officer at Azitra. Um, we um, moved from TIP in um, Hartford, outside of uh, Hartford, to Branford during the pandemic. So I have some really fun stories to tell you about that. Um, I've had the pleasure of working in a lot of biotech hubs, some of the major, some of the minor. I've worked in the, the Boston area, the San Francisco area, Vancouver, Montreal. Um, so I had a lot of experience looking in, in different communities and working in different communities. Um, and um, that really did help um, as we were considering where we wanted to move as we graduated out of our incubator space. And I can share um, some more about that. Um, I would say, you know, one of the, one of the lessons to be learned, uh, four of us sat in an office, oh, two years ago, maybe, and said, okay, we're going to be moving. Who's going to be managing it? Who's going to be managing the facility? There was a chief executive officer, a chief science officer, pay attention to these titles, and a VP of research, and myself as a chief operating officer. And one by one, they all looked at me and they said, there's one person in this room that has operating in their title. Gene, you're it. <laughs> so be careful about picking your titles. It didn't matter that I had never managed a facility in my life or managed to move. That didn't matter. That was not the relevant point. Um, we, um, we are a, even before the pandemic, semi-virtual synthetic microbiome germ company. We are clinical stage. Um, we have right now about 16 employees in Connecticut, another five up in um, the Montreal area at a facility up there. Um, so that's a little bit of the, the background about um, Azitra and myself. Um, I would say that not only are we a graduate of one incubator, but we've actually already expanded <coughs> and are in a second incubator right now. So we're kind of a, continue to be a hybrid organization. We have the pleasure of uh, taking space in Groton at the BioCT Innovation Commons. It's actually where we're setting up manufacturing uh, for the company. So uh, while I am a graduate, I am also still going through the process um, with yet another incubator. And a shout out to my landlords, they are excellent. We, we really are enjoying, sorry, my cat is trying to pull my lamp down. <laughs> uh, we really are enjoying that relationship as well. So um, I'll pass on to the next in the panel. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, Alyssa Waterman of FreeThink Technologies. Great. Good morning, everyone. And, and thanks to Jay and, and Spiegels and BioCT for setting up these panels. They've been incredibly informative and, and a really great way of sharing all of our experiences and, and making the hub better. Um, so I am the Chief Science Officer at uh, FreeThink Technologies. Uh, FreeThink Technologies is a little bit different company than the others we'll hear from today. So we are a company that works in the um, development, uh, drug development space. Uh, so we're known for our um, ASAP Prime, which is um, Accelerated Stability Assessment Program. We, we It's a combination of software and lab studies that help customers um, to uh, understand the stability of their drug in, in weeks rather than um, months to years. Um, we also are a full-fledged analytical chemistry lab, formulation development, and are developing some new technologies in the drug delivery area. So we also started as um, a TIP company um, 
And um, 10 years ago, actually we're coming up on our 10th anniversary. Um, and our first move was from the tip facility in stores where we kind of rented a U-Haul truck and moved our HPLC down from stores to Avery Point um, where we were till 2016. So we outgrew the incubator space in um, Avery Point, started looking for new lab space and the, the, the next place we could find lab space was in Brantford. So we moved to Brantford in 2016. Um, we're currently nearing 35 employees and are looking for um, kind of our uh, to, to expand more. We have a second lab here in Brantford and, and are looking to expand to a space where we can all be together. So I can I can talk more of that and, and really the requirements for chemistry labs versus also bio labs. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, now let's hear from Scott Phillips of Halda. Thanks, Jay, uh, and uh, welcome to everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks for holding the, the, these sessions. They've been really informative. Um, so, so my background, I've been in Connecticut biotech for geez, about the last 15 years. Uh, bulk of that was spent um, at Alexion Pharmaceuticals um, where I didn't manage any of the, any of the real estate um, or any of the, the space issues. And uh, when I left Alexion, I started um, with uh, smaller startup companies and I'm currently with, with Halda Therapeutics. Uh, we're a drug discovery company uh, founded by Craig Cruz, um, who also founded our Venice. Um, we're, uh, in in the midst of our Series A, looking to raise our Series B at, at this time, um, and uh, we we moved. Uh, we initially started in Brantford uh, for the first uh, little over two years, um, right across the street from Thimble Island Brewery. So that was a very strategic location uh, for us. And then uh, we moved um, in uh, in May of this year to Winchester Works. Um, and similar to Gene, uh, I don't have operating in my title. Um, but when, when the volunteers, uh, it was one of those things where everyone stepped backwards and I was the left, left with the one managing the move. Um, and, uh, but, but it was really a team effort uh, moving, moving over to, uh, uh, into Winchester Works. I can talk a little bit about the process. Uh, was fortunate to work with Svigals and the team um, in the design uh, part, of, part and uh, uh, Fusco on the construction side. So that actually went really well. And now we're in, in some great space uh, in uh, in Science Park and, and really enjoying it. Thank you, Sean. Oh, thank you, uh, Scott. I appreciate those words. Um, now let's turn to Sean Cassidy of our Venus. Yeah, thanks, Jay. This is Sean Cassidy. I'm the Chief Financial Officer uh, at our Venice. Um, you know, we are a therapeutics company with two assets uh, in phase two clinical trial testing. But we also have a very big component of our operations is, is in labs, uh, biology labs, as well as chemistry labs. Uh, we started at Science Park with 9,500 square feet uh, of space. And um, we currently have directionally about 60,000 square feet of space uh, over at Science Park. And, and we just signed a lease over at 101 College Street uh, to take on three floors, which is about 160,000 square feet. Our headcount since 2013 has grown from, I guess, in theory, zero people. That was our Series A. And directionally, we're probably around 220 people uh, here in Connecticut. We also uh, leverage another 200 to 250 synthetic chemists over in China. So if you look at our operational needs, it's heavy in biology, a uh, little lighter in chemistry, but we do have chemistry operations. Those all have challenges with respect to your facility. Um, and then as the company has progressed in the clinical trials, we do have a relatively large uh, part of our workforce right now that's uh, more office-based. I see Tavi here is on the screen. I can I, I can remember times in which we, we we had to use Tavi's van, quite frankly, to go and find used lab equipment uh, all over the state of Connecticut to populate our 9,500 square feet of space. And I think at the end of that time, uh, we needed to put a new transmission in his uh, in, in his vehicle, uh, which was which are always good stories to tell. Thank you very much. Uh, so it looks like we had a pretty good range of experience here in the, um, the panelists. Um, so uh, they, they sort of told you a little history of, of their trajectory. And now let's take a look at some specific questions. Uh, the first one we were thinking is, uh, what were the major factors for choosing your geographical location? So Sean, why don't you give us a little input on, on your story for that? Why'd you pick yeah, it was, uh, it was important to us to be close to our founder, Craig Cruz, uh, in the early days uh, of our Venice. We had a sponsored research agreement uh, uh, with his lab, 
and actually having him walk around the halls uh, was always very important. Uh, we actually employed several people that came out of his lab. Um, so, you know, having a New Haven presence uh, was important to the development of the organization itself. And going back into 2013, lab space wasn't nearly as tight as it is now in New Haven. And we, and we really did quite honestly find a, a facility at the time that had done, you know, I would say a good portion of the build outs necessary to get to get some chemistry operations up and running, uh, some biology operations up and running uh, in what I would say was very affordable space. So, you know, there were a confluence of things. One is there was space available, which is a very different situation uh, than we have today. Uh, we were close to our founder, uh, which was important. Uh, and we were close to some, some good talent. Uh, so that was, that was, those are the primary reasons for choosing Science Park. Alyssa, you had a little different story on what you were looking for and what you needed. Uh, can you tell us about why you ended up in Connecticut? So, so well, we were um, in Connecticut because um, so um, we came out of pharma in Connecticut. So my background was at Beringer Ingelheim, our founder. Um, he came out of Pfizer. Our first lab space was in Yukon, well, second, Yukon Avery Point. And a lot of our employees had been kind of out of the pharma um, you know, Connecticut Pharma and Pfizer. And so when we tried to move um, from Avery Point, we wanted to kind of stay close enough so that we can maintain our, our talent and maintain our employees. And so as we moved down the coast to be able to find available lab space, Brantford actually was the first, um, one of the first towns that had the infrastructure, the sewers, et cetera, and, and available lab space. So we were able to rent lab space there. The space that we moved into hadn't actually been occupied in about six years. So it took the first few years, it was renovated, it took the first few years to keep pulling rags out of the, um, the, the vents. But um, yeah, so, so we, we were able to come there, maintain our, our, our presence, our people, um, and then grow being in the New Haven areas, the New Haven bio, um, bi biotech industry has been growing. So it's made it easier to recruit people. Right. Scott, you've been in both the suburbs and uh, now uh, uh, central part of New Haven. Uh, what was your reasoning behind that? Yeah, so so when we when we initially started, um, I actually remember having a conversation with Sean when, when he took the CFO role at Halda. And, and Sean, the first thing he said was, oh, geez, you got to find some space real quick. And uh, <laughs> sure enough, that was a... Uh, that 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 was sort of uh, an early early issue for us. We were very fortunate to find space in Brantford um, and uh, and both lab and office, at which we quickly outgrew. Um, we knew we we did want to get back to New Haven. Um, so similar to Sean, the same founder, um, and and I think the proximity to Yale is is really important and uh, to the scientists and. So there's always a view towards getting back into the city. Um, so, so, so that that was a driving factor. Well, one other thing that sort of comes up is is sort of this uh, as we're recruiting, um, sort of the the sort of two spouse um, issues that that we have, where we might be recruiting where uh, you know one spouse might be working in New Haven, and then in order to you know another spouse might be working in in New York or in the city. And sort of having a nice location like New Haven, where folks are able to commute from Fairfield County, was really important. In fact, we, we hired a couple of people from sort of uh, spouses working in Westchester County or New York. So that, that so that was really important as well from a um, just from a proximity standpoint. That's great. And uh, Jean, I know you have a strong connection to New Haven. Uh, can you tell us a little more about why you're here? Sure. Um, we're a different uh, situation than the others in that at the time we were making a decision to move, um, I was living in the Boston area, our CEO was living in the Florida area, our CSO was living in the Pennsylvania area. Um, so we took time to actually think about moving out of state um, and looked at the pros and the cons of all of the major hubs. Um, we thought about um, everything from you know, Boston, Worcester, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, even Texas, because that's where our major investors are based. And sometimes that's an advantage to the company, but really decided um, for many reasons. We are founded by two Yale undergraduates, um, which is quite remarkable. So we have strong ties there. 
uh, the community has been extremely supportive. And I, I have to say, um, I've worked closely with bio affiliates across the country, and I find that BioCT is particularly um, helpful for, for companies like us. They've really gone the extra mile for me when I've had even minor issues. I know that I can reach out to Dawn and to the group. And, and that's not trivial. Um, I, I think that you have to consider uh, your employees, where the talent is, where your money's coming from, because people who invest often do want you to be physically close. Um, but I think also the support of the community is very helpful. Uh, we chose Brantford. Um, and like Elise, uh, the building that we moved into had not been occupied for, for numerous years. We worked very closely with the landlord uh, throughout that, but that is something as you think about your new space that you might be moving into to understand the history of the building as well as where you want to take it. Thank you very much. So um, moving on to number two, uh, the second question, uh, and Jeannie will have you start again here, but uh, what were your major factors uh, when you chose a building? Um, it was, it's interesting. Um, the There was one person who lived in the Branford area. Um, so Branford was an area that we focused on. Um, as you've heard, the word Branford has come up numerous times on the panel. There is um, a, a growing uh, consortium of biotech companies in that space that also uh, had an influence, but also as, as you know, anybody here who's looking at moving, anybody here who has moved knows, it is not easy to get lab space. It's not easy to get lab space with the office space that you might need, with any manufacturing space that you might need. I know ours are fairly um, simple compared to what uh, FreeThink goes through with chemistry labs, uh, but it still is a challenge. And it really is, you have to get out there and look at a lot of space and, and see what is the best fit. There's nothing that's ever gonna be perfect. Uh, as with uh, buying a house, right? It's always, you know, what are the key issues that need to be addressed and you try to tick those off. Thanks. And um, how about Scott? You um, you moved from uh, Bramford, New Haven. Uh, you had a pretty probably in-depth process going uh, before you picked the Winchester Works building. Um, what are some of the factors that um, you looked at when choosing not only a building, but uh, maybe even the building owner. Sure, yeah, uh, yeah. And w I mean, we really started in late 2018 looking for space. And we, as I mentioned, we found the space in Brantford and we, we were looking for our uh, next space throughout. Um, uh, and, and I would say, um, you know, we met with a lot of brokers, a lot of developers, a lot, you know, a lot of the developers, quite honestly, had sort of no um, background in building lab space. Um, and so, so sort of spent spent some time with, with folks where it just was clear that it, it wouldn't move forward. And then, you know, fortunately, I think in the last kind of year to 18 months, I think there's been more and more um, developers, investors uh, coming into the New Haven, the surrounding areas. So, we were really fortunate um, uh, to find Winchester Works and the folks at Twining who um, they, they had not built labs in the um, in the building we were moving into, but they definitely had a desire to really do it right. As I mentioned, they had Spiegel's at Fusco doing the, the construction. So um, I think that was definitely um, attractive for us. Uh, they they wanted to make the building um, be based on Location Science Park to be a, a real um, hub for for biotech and lab based uh, 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 companies. So they were willing to put the investments in the HVAC and generators and and all the other things that you need um, to operate labs. So so I think that was that was really attractive for us um, to have a landlord that that was really supportive. So so I think that that's important to have sort of developers and operating companies that have run labs before who, who sort of know what the issues are when uh, when there's a storm and the and and the you know the generator doesn't come on you know who, who's available there to uh, come on and, and and troubleshoot the issues i think those are the things that, that are really important um, and then I, you know i would say in the last like i said in the last year i think things are getting uh, much better. Uh, I think we have 101 College um, coming down the pike. Uh, Winchester Works. They're looking to bring in more lab lab based folks. So I think I think for for companies starting the search now, I think the the great thing is that there's a lot of different alternatives, and you can really, you know, in our case, we were really looking at one, maybe two. I think that in, in, you know now 
and you, as you look forward a couple of years, I think folks can probably pick between two or three different locations that are the best strategic fit for them. It's good to hear that um, you're seeing a little more space availability because that's important for growing our cluster here. Um, uh, Sean, um, you obviously have a bigger need, so you couldn't, you probably have much more limited choices. Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to 2013 quickly and then I'll move into kind of our decisions around one on one college. But, you know, going back to 2013, you know, there was ample space out. And I can tell you that the folks at um, Science Park and Science Park Development Corp, I mean, they really were great to work with, qu quite honestly. Uh, we were able to find, uh, again, it was, you know, just under 10,000 square feet, which was perfect for about a 25 person company that had lab infrastructure that could support a chemistry side of our lab, as well as a biology side of our lab. And, you know, our ability to grow at Science Park um, with the help of Science Park Development Corp was quite frankly, just fantastic. But as the company, you know, became large, and we'll probably touch on this a little later on in the presentation, biotech moves pretty fast, right? And all of a sudden you hit a value inflection point where you're at a sprint, right? And that's where we've been at for, for an extended period of time. And we've obviously outgrown uh, Science Park. So we went on a, you know, a process in which we, you know, interviewed multiple developers. And I, I can echo exactly what Scott said, you have to have really good confidence around someone who's done it before. Um, and somebody who actually knows what they're doing on how to put labs in. And the thing that really attracted at least me, I'm sure Art uh, would attest to this, who's on the phone here, is really the infrastructure that 101 College Street is, is including in their building where it's already being designed to house 60% lab and 40% office space, right? There's already, there was already a tenant in there that was all lab with their incubator piece. So that gave me and our board, quite frankly, a lot of confidence uh, that they could uh, produce a building like that. And it also helps that they did one right behind it at 100 College Street. So, you know, the important pieces there, you know, in terms of takeaways are, you know, if someone's telling you they've done labs before, make sure you, you know, you vet that out because if they haven't, it's different and it's hard. But, they, but folks that have and they've done it before, you should have confidence in them to, to go forward and, and be able to produce a quality piece of property and one that'll fit your needs. So when you're looking at 101 College, uh, obviously having 100 College there um, was a good thing, but this is a building that's not built. You're going to take a lot of square footage. Was it a uh, easy process to figure out what you had to do there? No, I would say, you know, one of, as, as I mentioned earlier, right, you hit these value inflection points and next, you know, the company is, you know, your, your, your five-year outlook, you know, goes from 150 people to 500 people all of a sudden, and you got to start thinking about how you're going to commercialize things. So, I mean, the really, the one thing that we did relatively early in our process, quite frankly, which we did a little bit earlier was, was an exercise in which we took different scenarios uh, in ways in which our Venice could develop and try to do some test fit exercises and predict what your square footage is gonna look like. So we've gone through that exercise a couple of times at our Venice. It's been helpful. It's never perfect, you know, in terms of trying to predict it, um, but it is helpful to give you some type of scale in terms of, you know, different scenarios and what you may or may not need. Right. And Alyssa, you, you found out there weren't too many choices when in your search when you were looking. Can you tell us a little bit about how your factors, how would you factored in when choosing a building? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we first moved to Brantford, there wasn't a lot of choices. Um, and, um, and now for the past couple of years, we've been looking to expand and, and consolidate um, in the um, kind of shoreline area. So we've been focusing more on the um, kind of suburbs than um, New Haven, mostly for um, just, just more competitive costs, um, also for just convenience of um, kind of being kind of par parking right, right outside the door of, of, of your lab. Um, so, I mean, I think it has been um, a struggle and we're still, um, you know, kind of in negotiation for, for space. So we've looked at building, we've looked at um, starting from scratch, we've looked at renovating existing buildings. So I think a lot of the points that have been brought up today and in the past panels about finding landlords that really understand how to build lab space, um, kind of learn, get, becoming educated yourselves in things that you never thought you'd be educated about, like HVAC and, and air exchanging and, and emergency power, um, hiring consultants so that you're really going into these things with um, 
eyes open. So I think it, it's it's a process um, that is um, kind of you know still challenging. I mean, it's so exciting that that New Haven is building so much more lab space and hoping it will um, kind of move out into the <clears throat> into the into the surrounding area too. Um, Brantford's a little bit behind, but but hopefully over the next couple of years it will also um, catch up in terms of um, um, enabling um, more more lab space. So um, and and I think I just wanted to point out, and and as I think as Kate mentioned, so we're predominantly chemistry lab, not bio lab. So the the requirements, even people who have built labs before, may have built bio labs that have different air handling requirements than chemistry labs. So chemistry needs a lot more airflow because of the the, the, the hoods and, and exchange. So I think that's been a challenge too in terms of being able to build the infrastructure. Um, initially, also we wanted to build in GMP manufacturing capabilities in our own building, and we kind of realized that that was too much of a stretch. So we've kind of taken that out and found another partner um, in, in Connecticut that we can work with to be able to, to do the GMP manufacturing for our, our drug delivery technology. So, so I think it's trying to narrow what you absolutely need um, and, and how to make that happen. <laughs> Um, like like a house. At the beginning, you want everything, and then as you you go through the process, you you really kind of focus on what you absolutely need. Yeah, thank you, Jane. Uh, oh, listen, excuse me. So um, so now let's talk a little bit about the process of finding that new space. Um, you know, what were some of the key issues uh, that you have to deal with? Because you know, we ha we have a support community of real estate professionals in the in the area, the real estate community. Um, designers and like, have you found this community support uh, useful and um, and what were the most problematic uh, areas? Uh, Lisa, you're talking about obviously finding chemistry labs, but were there more uh, issues that uh, complicated your search? Um, and so we've been working with a, a group of people, so real estate agents, developers, um, and um, and, and, and landlords. So, so I think basically, I mean, the good part about the bioscience community here is that it's a really tight knit community. And so everybody knows everybody, everybody knows kind of what buildings are available. So I think that that's been a very positive, um, a very positive experience. Experience. Um, I think it's just frustrated in terms of, you know, land, uh, ability for land use, um, you know, infrastructure, um, you know, I, I think we're still at the cusp of, of building up labs in, in the area. So, so I think for everyone, it's, it's frustrating because there just isn't a ready supply of, of potential buildings and labs and it, everything takes a long time until it can be um, realized. Scott, did you um, did you use brokers and real estate professionals, or did you sort of handle the process yourself? What was your your process of uh, using the community to find your new space? Uh, yeah, I I would say all of the above, um, and, and I think that's one of the sort of frustrating parts around uh, looking for space is just that there's really in the New Haven area, it, there's really no sort of central place you go to find the, you can't go to one place and sort of see everything that's available. And, and, and maybe that'll change over time. Um, you know, we, uh, I, I think what, what Alyssa said about um, just using your network, um, people on this call, people um, that you know, um, you know, the, the great thing about uh, Connecticut biotech is sort of everybody's in the same boat. Um, a lot of people know each other. There's a lot of connections. Um, so uh, over the course of the past few years and in, in terms of looking for space, I mean, I, I've leveraged uh, folks on this call. Um, uh, Dawn over at BioCT has been great in sort of keeping tabs on, on everything that's going on. So I, I think just leveraging network is, is really, really, is really, really critical. Um, and then the other thing, and I think Sean touched on this, I, I think the other difficult part always is looking out um, beyond the, the, the immediate term and the, what the immediate needs are. So you're, you know, you're looking for, you're looking for space, there might be limited options, but you're also looking for potential to expand your, your space. And so, so that, that combination is always difficult to find. Um, so, so that's something that I would just keep an eye out as you're looking for a building. It might be great for today, it might be great for the next two years, but if you look three, four, five years, is that really, um, you know, is that really a space that you wanna be in? Thanks, Scott. 
Sean, how about you? How did you handle your search for a new space? Yeah, I mean, I would just echo what Scott said, right? It really is about the network. This is a pretty close, tight-knit community uh, here in the greater New Haven area. And most of the people are here on the phone. Reach out to them all the time. Uh, talk to them all the time. Kind of, you know, I, I, you'll hear me say this phrase in other settings, but be in the game to some extent, right? And just have a sense of what's going on. Um, and Jay, you kind of asked about what was the frustrating piece for us, uh, you know, the, the biggest frustrations I would say for us was probably 2019 when I have an expanding set of biologists and chemists and I couldn't keep up with their lab needs. Uh, Art remembers these times and it was hard. And the biggest frustration was actually the lead time to actually demo an area and get actually a lab, you know, put in. That is not a two or three month process. That is a nine month process at best. Um, so, you know, that the timelines are long and the capital infrastructure is large. So that's why you really kind of need that long-term planning. And it's always hard to execute on something be actually, before you actually hit that value inflection point. Uh, sometimes you have to with a little bit of faith and sometimes it makes sense, maybe not to. Uh, that all has, a, has to do with how much confidence you have at the time. Yeah, so continue on that. You know, we, we, we know you all ran out of space and, and everybody on the phone on the call here is ran out of space before you were able to move into your new facility. Um, how did you survive that intervening time? And you're in the middle of it right now. What you I was just going to say we're surviving it right now. And I think as everybody's looking at a screen, that's how we're surviving it right now, right? Um, the technology has been fantastic. Um, I do believe uh, that 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 the workforce was progressing down this way back in call it, you know, the beginning of 2020, and it would have got there, you know, in five, seven, eight years, but COVID sped that up by a year, uh, quite honestly, and, and, and it does work well. Um, you know, it works better for some departments than it does for others, uh, but it doesn't work well for labs, right? You, you can't, you know, all of a sudden decide to set up, you know, 100 different labs in people's garage. That doesn't work that way, as you, as you guys all know. Um, so at that point in time, you know, you got to really make sure um, in an environment in which we're in today and one in which we've hired too many people for the number of seats that we have for them is that, you know, the folks that require the most infrastructure, that be your biologists and your chemists, they get first dibs on, on, on space in, this, in, in, in your facility and then utilize the technology to the extent you can um, for everything else. Uh, and that's kind of the approach that we, that we took at our Venice. Yeah, uh, Scott, how about your uh, story in the in the intervening years before you got your new space? Yeah, uh, Al, I just simply echo what Sean was saying. I think um, COVID was in some ways that allowed us to uh, to to um, do uh, do more with less. Um, and when when COVID hit, we essentially anyone that could work from home was working from home. Uh, obviously the biologists need to be in the lab. We, we for a while we ran in shifts. Uh, so um, just to de-densify the, the location, but really, um, you know, sort of, sort of uh, we were able to manage in a real small space um, and, uh, and, and get the scientists working. Um, there, that that worked for a while, um, and uh, even now, where we are in, in New Haven, we're we're sort of managing the the some aspects of that. Although most most people are in the office, but really um, using learning to use the virtual um, as much as possible for folks that don't don't need to be in the lab is sort of how we manage it. So, Gene, how'd you handle this uh, this need for your for your because you're also a growing company. Yeah, we, we hit a, a wall really uh, very soon. I've been with a company two years, uh, really soon after I was hired. As we started to expand, we just had closed on a financing. So, of course, that's when you, you have your growth spurts. Um, and we were a tip. And as with everybody else, you'll hear there was a focus, make sure that the research group is supported. Um, so that meant that at times when myself and the CEO were in the, the building at the same time, it was kind of like he had the big desk in the corner in a, like an eight by 10 room. And I had the little mini desk over in the other corner. Try doing business that way with your boss, by the way, in the room. Um, so quickly we realized that was not going to work and made the decision to take office space in New Haven. 
and uh, keep the labs at TIP, support them there while we were uh, both looking for and then coordinating the move. Um, it's not always great to do that. As you know, that's an us versus them that, that can really be a problem as much as you say you're gonna make the drive out to, um, to the facility, you know, that, that hour drive on top of your commute into the offices becomes onerous. So we, you know, look, it worked. Um, we were able to, you know, keep the company running, keep everybody kind of coordinated. Um, that's the kind of thing you have to do. But then when we moved to Brantford, we actually thought we'd gone through all those exercises that Sean talked about, but we never planned for a pandemic. So, you know, we had two people sharing offices. Um, we had plenty of lab space. Uh, we were very fortunate moving into a building where we controlled also, by the way, our own bathrooms. I brought in the cleaning service that even the cleaning equipment didn't go into other buildings. And I was fortunate about that. Uh, we built a conference center in, we had 3,000 square feet of warehouse that when we moved in, we had no idea what to do with it. We were thinking of subletting it. We were thinking about, in a couple of years, growing into it. It has been a life, uh, just a, um, a real lifesaver. Uh, during the pandemic because we could hold meetings in there, 3,000 square feet, social distancing. We've, we've continued to have our happy hours, um, have events, and now we've turned into a conference center um, so that we can continue this hybrid model. Um, so that's how we managed it. I, I would say also, I just want to come back on, on your last question because we've been talking about uh, brokers and, and landlords and so on. The other thing that um, that there are, there are a number of people that can help you with this move process. And so we chose to go with a project manager. Um, thank goodness, because she could really uh, help to not only coordinate things, but she had the knowledge that I was lacking and other people involved with the move uh, was lacking. We also brought in a designer and I can tell you, well, that sounds kind of like a designer, you know, that's okay. People who've been in our space both before and after we moved in has said it looks, you know, three times larger, um, just based on help with picking paint and tiles and carpeting. It is different than doing that for your home. So getting in someone who can help with that is really, really very important. The thing we did not do, and we consciously did this to save money, is we did not bring in an engineering um, lab design group or, or individual. We, we thought there was gonna be very minimal uh, with the renovations that we had planned. And you know what? Even with really minimal, that was a huge mistake. It ended up costing us both time and money uh, in setting up our, our autoclave and our millipore filter system that just wasn't being piped correctly. and such a headache. So I, I would urge you to bring in the right people to support you, not only in selecting your space, uh, but as you um, build out, renovate and, and coordinate the move, bring in the right people. Don't try to save money because it's going to cost you at the back end. Well, obviously, I believe in that advice. <laughs> I, um, I wasn't doing a, an ad, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alyssa, how about you? You are... you. You were uh, kind of all over here too, uh, figuring out how, how to keep from running out of space. Yeah, so we were very fortunate in that we had already started, um, we, we had already made the plan to rent additional lab space because we were running out of space in our main lab. So we had already kind of started the process um, of getting additional space, it was being renovated. So when the pandemic started in March, our, we got our new space for, and our formulation new technologies group moving into it in May. We're also fortunate because it's right next door to Jean. So, so we have an awesome <laughs> next door neighbor there. Um, and so, um, so that helped. So then as, as everybody else, we learned that everyone who could work from home was working from home. It's hard for us to kind of do lab shifts, but, but we tried to spread people out as much as possible. And only the people that absolutely needed to be on site were in sight. And so, and we're still, as we're planning for our new space, you know, we had a lot more shared space and we, our new plans are really breaking it up more into individual offices and, and more walls and less shared space. And I think that that's going to be a kind of outgrowth of, of the pandemic, how we think about space, office space, how we think about, you know, like how we're going to manage our space. Yeah. So, Scott, um, you obviously had to had to make that move recently here and, and hold in your place. How, how did you keep planning for the future while you know, controlling costs? Because that's very critical for uh, startup companies. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I just want to echo something that Gene said. Um, 
about uh, sort of knowing what you don't know going into these things. Um, so, so as an example, picking the uh, picking the paint colors and the furniture, that was not something that I was planning to do. So I, I hired, uh, actually, Svigal's uh, assisted with some of those things. And, and believe me, the amount of time that we spent was uh, reduced significantly just on, on things like that. Um, so so the, there's little, little details that you need to uh, deal with along the way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think just uh, I'll echo <laughs> sort of what I said before, um, just um, sort of th this idea of, and this is sort of a central theme, I think, uh, for today, this idea of always looking forward, always figuring out how far you want to lean forward. Um, and and we're, we're sort of in this in this stage now, sort of, okay, we're about to raise the next round of financing. Uh, data is coming in from the labs. How do we sort of interpret that and um, uh, transition <clears throat> that into operational decisions? And there's no, there's never a perfect answer, um, right? There, there's never, a, um, you, you know, you do a three-year plan or five-year plan. It, it's, it'll never, but one thing you know is that it, it will not happen the way you expect it. So um, just you have to be sort of cautious. Um, I think I like the term Sean used. Uh, sometimes you just have to have a little bit of faith um, because you can't, you have to take on some risk at some, at some points um, without getting too far ahead of yourself. So I, I think that's always the, the balance in biotech. You know, you're looking to sign, uh, you know, uh, sometimes folks are looking to you to sign like a 10 year lease in biotech. 10 years, you'll either be 10 times the size of the space that you're looking at or, or you'll be out of business. So um, that, that's, always, uh, that's always the challenge um, that, that we have in biotech. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we all know that uh, BioCT is, is doing a lot to support um, uh, the, the uh, cluster we have growing here. The state of Connecticut is doing a lot of things too uh, that are right in, in, in getting the right people to the table and, and looking for alternative funding sources and, make this a great environment. Uh, we know there's always something more that we need. Um, and uh, Sean, I know that you spoke a little bit about vivarium, uh, about vivarium needs. What can, you, what can you tell us more about how is that, why is that important and what could that do for our, uh, our cluster here? Yeah, I would look at it as, uh, I would almost consider it a critical infrastructure to support a growing biotech community, um, particularly for therapeutics companies. I, I know some of the other folks here on the phone don't, don't, don't have needs for a vivarium, but it's also typically outside the core expertise of a therapeutics-based company. I'm sure, you know, Halda Therapeutics has no desire to hire a veterinarian and to hire someone who can do husbandry services and, and, and all these other things that, quite frankly, are very specialized. Um almost think of it like a road as infrastructure, right? To actually have therapeutics companies grow, they need to have access to a vivarium. They're very expensive to build. Um, they're very specialized to run and it's hard to find the right people. So in terms of where could the state of Connecticut help support uh, to support this ecosystem is to help and support a company or a series of companies to come into the area and offer vivarium services. We have one, which is Nels, and they're packed. Uh, and they're packed because our Venice, you know, takes most of their rooms. And they do, they do a great job. But I think the need out there is much larger uh, than that because right now we're, we're shipping some, some of our experiments out to where, you know, out, out outside the state. Um, but to actually have that core infrastructure uh, in place where multiple companies can access it, um, I think would be a fantastic use of state dollars and my tax dollars. Scott, I know you need vivarium uh, space and you have a similar issue. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what you see as a alternative, uh, something that we could do here in this region? Yeah, I, again, I'll echo what John said. We're, we're in the same boat looking for vivarium space, trying to figure out, do we, do we use space locally, outsource it? Do we build something ourselves? Do we look uh, uh, further outside Connecticut? Um, but it, I, I, to I totally agree with Sean. It's a, it's a, it's a critical need um, for, for biotech in Connecticut. If you're developing a, a therapeutic, you, you absolutely need some vivarium space. And particularly for small companies, um, 
nobody wants to build their own and run their own. Um, it, it's just a, a bit a bit daunting from a dollars uh, perspective and just sort of a uh, a focus perspective, right? You want to focus on 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 developing drugs, not running a, a vivarium. So so uh, totally agree with Sean. So Alyssa, um, you did a lot of looking and, and finding your space and, and staying here in the Connecticut. Uh, what do you think the state could do more or, or what have they done well for you and what could they do more? So, I mean, I think really support infrastructure growth. I mean, I think lab space investors are starting to come into the area and invest in lab space, but, but I think we need more infrastructure here. Um, I mean, I think there's also great in, they've talked about in the previous panels, great, great um, space that's coming, great incubator space, but then where's everybody going to go? So as people expand, you know, there's, there's still this huge need for lab space. So if the state could then help bring more investment into, you know, expanded lab space here in the area, I think that would be really critical for the growth of the industry here. Yeah. Jean, how about you? Do you have some suggestions? Um, I have to say that I, I really um, have not had a huge number of issues, um, and, and I had just moved during the pandemic from Boston, so Connecticut is new for me, and, and uh, I don't have a lot to offer in this category. <laughs> How about our BioCT network? Has that been working for you? BioCT, is, as I've said before, has, has really been very, very supportive. Um, I had an issue when we were moving. Um, they, they really helped me to, to figure that out. It, it would have kept us from being functional for, for six to eight months, potentially. Um, and I was also able to reach out to the legislature, um, our local um, assemblywoman, our local senator, uh, assemblyman, and, and uh, senator, uh, Senator Cohen, has been very, very helpful as well. Okay, great. And um, how about our communities themselves? Are they... Uh, giving you the support you need and in, in not basically in lab space, but in, in all those other support for bringing uh, the best and talented uh, staff. Uh, how, are we, how are we doing about that in this part of the state? Jean, go ahead. Um, I, think, I think as many people have said, um, we're doing very, very well, but there's a lot of room as, as a community grows, uh, as we expand. Um, you know, we are pushing it, it and recruiting. All, all of us you've heard are growing and expanding and looking for more and more people. Uh, that becomes a challenge. Um, you know, I think that we're very fortunate to have some excellent academic um, institutions that we can pull from, um, several large pharma. Uh, I think the more that we can attract that, the better. I think the more uh, companies that come into this space, uh, the better, the more that are successful where people will um, have their own desires to to go off and and, um, and start companies. Um, so I think that you know there are some challenges as you expand the community. We're going to find that these needs are only going to grow. But I think that that's a positive thing. Melissa, how about you? Is your community supporting your uh, company in um, in many in the ways that you would expect and need? Um, and I think what one thing we need to do is that there are so many companies in the New Haven area, and I think BioCT has worked really hard with everybody to have more visibility. So, so I think the perception of the New Haven area as a you know biotech hub is growing, which helps enormously in trying to recruit. So I think, as everyone's alluded to, it's been it's it's challenging to kind of recruit enough people to fill the growth of, of our companies in the area. And the more the, the community is perceived as a vibrant community, the easier it will be to recruit people so they know that they can come to a stable bioscience community, that there's jobs if there's if it's two couple, you know, a couple that need multiple jobs in the area. So, so I think it's increasing the visibility, which I think will be um, really important um, as, the, as the community grows. Yeah. So, uh, Scott, how about you? How are you finding the community support for and, and is there something New Haven region needs to be doing uh, for your company that would improve your uh, prospects? Yeah, I, I don't I, I can't think of anything in particular. I, you know, the the commute, the broader community, if you look at BioCT, if you look at Yale, if you look at 
the companies um, who are participating in calls like this, um, you look at the VC networks, I, I think um, the community is very supportive. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, everyone's in the same boat, right? We're, we're all sort of trying to figure things out, how to grow, um, grow our biotech business um, in Connecticut. I think, you know, the one thing on the talent front where, where we've had a lot of success um, is at the more junior levels and, and um, uh, getting, in, getting folks um, either undergrad, masters, or PhDs uh, from local schools um, and the Biopath program. I think it's run by Southern, um, it, it has been really um, helpful. We've gotten a few folks from there um, and we've sort of trained them brought them on in some cases as, as interns for a short period of time. And in many cases, actually, in most cases, they become full-time uh, folks. So that, that's, you know, the more we can work at, at keeping the young folks in Connecticut, they graduate from UConn, they graduate from Yale, um, Albertus, uh, Southern, uh, all these schools, keeping them in, in Connecticut is, is really important. How about you, Sean? Are you using, uh, uh, you know, you're growing now, so you're probably uh, having more entry level people coming in uh, after your lead scientist uh, is the biopath program and the, the feeders from UConn and, and the other universities uh, benefiting you? It, all of it's helpful. And uh, I do think, you know, um, as, as Arvin has matured over its years at the, the, the state, BioCT, you know, was very helpful in that process. I do think we're actually at a point right now, though, where there's a huge opportunity in front of us because Jeannie, you'll know this, this isn't Cambridge, right? <laughs> when you look at trying to recruit folks here, the number one you know, fear is what happens if the biotech company goes down? Now I got to uproot my family again because there's not enough critical mass of companies around. I think that's still the case. It's gotten a, tr it's gotten a lot better um, uh, since 2013, but I do think we're actually on that, on that tipping point where there could be a critical mass three or four years down the road. And why do I think that one money's flowing? That's good, right? That's it's it's been money has been flowing for a while, and I expect it to continue. At least that's what I've been hearing from all our bankers, right? And we also have space right now. So with 101 College Street in 2024, there's going to be a fair amount of available lab space. And when our Venice pulls out of Science Park, it's going to free up a lot more space for other companies, right? So now, I, and I'm and I'm sure the state's doing this. I'm just not familiar with it. Now is the time to start marketing to those venture companies who are gonna be creating the companies of the future and for other companies up in the Cambridge area and the New York area to start recruiting them uh, to the New Haven area. I think this is the right time. I don't have a good sense of exactly what the effort is behind it uh, on the state, but if you look at you know kind of competition, New York uh, is heavily recruiting biotechs, right? They have program after program after program that add up into the billions of dollars. I do think you know Connecticut can compete with that. I think our ecosystem uh, is going to be better, but I think this is the time you need to start marketing that. And 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 I'm sure they're either doing it or plan on doing it. But this this is a critical time. I think that's great thoughts, Sean, about the, our future. Uh, Scott, what do you think our ecosystem is going to be like in three to five years? Um, well, I think we're trending in the right direction. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful. Uh, as I mentioned, I think private investment is, is critical. I think anything the, the state can do to support that is critical. Um, so, um, you know, so, so I, I think we're definitely trending in the right direction. I think um, uh, 101 College, I think, will be a significant uh, improvement um, just in terms of having some incubator space for small companies. And then, uh, as, as Sean mentioned, our Venice Moving in there, uh, our building in Winchester works. We we have um, additional lab folks, uh, tenants. Science Park will free up. Um, so so I think we're definitely moving in the right direction. Um, it's it's just a matter of balance, right? Will how will the supply and demand balance out over the next few years? Right now, I'd say supply is is still a little short. Um, we'd we'd like to have more. Uh, more supply for um, the the money flows that are coming in and the new companies that are, that are being created. So um, you know what what I would say is for any developers like now now is a great time to start building out and getting getting in front of it um, in terms of bringing bringing folks in. So so I, I'm I'm very optimistic um, and like I said in the last sort of year to eighteen months I've seen a lot of uh, traction moving in the right direction. Good. How do you, Alyssa, how do you see the future uh, in this region? 
Um, I, I agree with um, what Scott said. I, I think the, the trajectory is definitely in the right direction. Things are increasing. There's more outside investment in the area in incubator space. I know a few years ago, we were having the discussion about being able to figure out a way of having incubator space, and now we're, we're getting more of that. So I think that is cool. Um, I think the diversification is good. I don't think we can have mentioned that, that not only is there bioscience in the traditional drug discovery, but we also have um, companies that are kind of engineering and like, like isoplexus, like device and, and all sorts of kind of working in that the health space, semaphore. So, so I like the diversification that we're happening and, and continuing to happen in the area um, in tech, biotech. So, so I, I think we're heading in a good direction, but, but we need just more space and, uh, you know, and, and ability to appeal to having recruit, recruiting people here. Sure, that's pretty great. And um, Jane, what are your thoughts on the, the future and what we're seeing happening here in the area? Well, I, I will summarize this with a, um, a nod to an old classic movie when I say um, that there's um, one, one word I've learned. I've learned instead of plastics, plenum. So look at my education. Look at what's happened to me. Um, no, I, I will... Um, Whenever anybody asks me that question, I look at them and I say, I chose to move to Connecticut. I, um, at my point in my career, having looked at the options, chose to come here. And it has been an extremely successful uh, venture from my perspective. And I'm very excited about where my company and this community is going to go. So I, I um, answer that with my feet, I guess, is the best way to say that. That's, that is great. All right. So. Um... I'd like to hear from each of you some sage advice um, for audiences. as they look to house their growing life science companies here in Connecticut, really based on what you have lived through in the last many years and in, in creating your space. What are some of the most important advice you can give to other bioscience companies as they begin to develop or think about, you know, where they go next and maybe even when they start thinking about it? Um, Scott, you want to talk, start talking there? Uh, sure. Yeah. So number one, and, and we've kind of hit this is, is just find, find a way to get some expansion rights into your, uh, into your space. I think, um, I think that's, that's really important to sort of plan ahead. Um, and, and we've sort of hit, hit this a, a few times. Um, the, the one thing I'll, I'll mention is more on, sort of on the construction side and, uh, the planning side. So, um, I, I think one thing we did uh, really well, and, and thanks, uh, thanks again to Spiegel's and uh, Amar Amaris in particular, was uh, we sort of very, as we led up to the construction period, we, um, we, we planned like, uh, had a number of different planning meetings. So it's like every square inch we had we had planned out and it was like meeting after meeting and you're like, oh geez, is this ever gonna end? And, uh, and, and, then, and then suddenly it ended and construction started. And I, I found that I, every time I checked in with Fusco to say, okay, how, how are things going? Everything went totally according to plan, no issues. And you hear all about all these nightmares with, with construction, whether it's with, with your own home or with, with a business. And um, I, I think the upfront planning is, is really critical. Um, and, and that's something that, um, that I would definitely, if, if you are uh, building your own space, just make sure you're spending the time. We had a, a sort of a cross-functional team, um, uh, sort of uh, myself, some of the scientists, we met every week to go through sort of the planning and then ultimately to go through the moves, everything that needs to move, all the vendors lining those things up. So I, I think sort of the upfront planning and coordination is really important. And I think Scott, with your organization, we developed an early programming study, uh, which allowed you to look at all these different buildings, because we know in New Haven, we've got uh, Winchester Works, Science Park, 101 College on its way, and then the Elm City Bioscience Center at 55 Church. And then in Brantford, uh, there's a number of uh, flex-based buildings that are becoming very effective for uh, spaces. Um, Jane, how about you? What is your sage mm -hmm. advice for um, new uh, startup companies as they're looking for new space. What's the most so, 
important. There are so many lessons and, and, and uh, hearing everybody on the panel talk, you know, there's like, oh yeah, I remember that. Oh yeah, that's really important. A couple of things um, that we haven't talked about. I think as you're, you're making your plans and this was always the case, but certainly coming out of the pandemic even more so, think about how, how much do you need in bricks and mortar and how much can you build into flexibility um, in terms of the hybrid, as, as Sean was saying, you have to, if you have more people, then you can, you can put uh, seats in, the, in a chair or a lab bench. Um, but, but I think you know, that's certainly been something that has uh, allowed us to uh, continue to grow and, and be cost effective and cost conscious is make decisions about what we're going to put into space and what we're not. And we made a, a, a very important decision, which, which is unusual for a company like ours, which is, um, you know, uh, early clinical stage, and that's to do our own manufacturing. So even something like that, uh, there's a lot of thought process that goes into all these aspects associated with the, with the company. Um, the other thing that we didn't touch on, which, I, which um, having lived through this, is um, thinking about running it once you have it. Um, you know, everybody coming out of an incubator is used to all of that support and different incubators give you different support. But I can tell you that as I sat there with water coming up from the sewers and water coming down from the plenum, which I didn't know existed until I moved into the building, I, um, we were very cautious. We had been planning to hire a facility manager, but it was the pandemic when everybody was trying to be very careful uh, and keep their companies afloat. And I finally said to the CEO, I'm sorry, um, you know, the facility manager has got to come because I can't take this anymore. Um, so think about the fact that someone, you know, from buying the TP, figuring out why there's water coming down from the ceiling, um, setting up clean harbors to come to get all of your, um, your waste, right? All of those things. Uh, we're taken care of by an incubator. So I think one of the important lessons is also plan for what life is going to be like after you move. Oh, I like that advice. Um, uh, Lisa, uh, Liz, uh, excuse me, Alyssa, how, how about you? What are you uh, thinking about uh, for uh, most important advice for others? So I think educate yourself about what the requirements are for lab space. Think carefully about what, you know, what space you want for lab versus wet lab, dry lab, um, your office space so that you can really plan it. And then just build in the fact that it's going to take probably two or three times longer than you would ever think it's going to take. So, so you need to start the process really early and make arrangements in the meantime to, to manage until you actually get your space. Yeah, Sean, I think that's probably your story too about starting early, especially with a, a facility move of your size. Um, what, what were your thoughts on that? I think it, I'll, I'll, I'll use two things because I'm going to repeat a lot of the stuff Scott said, so I don't want to do that. So I'm going to try and build that into a, a bit of a different statement, right? Plan for success, right? And speed matters, right? The time value of money in the biotech arena is amplified 10 times of what it is in any other traditional uh, traditional industry, right? And why is that, right? If you look at, you know, one year's worth of drug sales, uh, and I'm putting my CFO hat on, so I hope you guys don't mind. But if you look at one year of drug sales, and you could have actually, you know, brought that in one year earlier, think about how much value you've created for your, for your shareholders. So, you know, plan for success, do all the things Scott said, you know, build in expansion rights, have plans out there that you can execute on on a dime, and 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 proceed forward with a with a sense of urgency and do it as quickly as you can. Okay, thank you all. Um, I was looking through some of the questions here, so everybody can send in some more questions. I'm sure uh, stuff has has been brought up uh, through this um, uh, through this um, session this morning. Uh, one one thought um, we'd like to hear about again is going back to the vivarium issue, all right? We know that there is a lack of them, but are there, uh, similar to chemistry, I know chemistry is done outside the state, uh, outside your offices that, that is now has a third party uh, possibilities. Uh, what if you did vivarium work outside the state? Is there the possibility to do something there? I mean, I'll chime in. There's always the possibility, turnaround times are slower. Um, you don't, you know, you're not having your own people actually go in and dissect the animals to the extent you need to, uh, models, you may want to create your own internal models. 
there's a whole reason to actually have vivarium close close to your uh, close to your location, at least close to your biology lab. Yeah, Scott, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. I mean, in in drug discoveries, as people know, you're it's a constant iterative process, trial and error. You're you're trying different things and and sort of. Um, with something like a vivarium, you're, you're, if you're relying on folks that are not sort of nearby or next door, it just makes it makes it difficult for uh, the science to progress. It makes it difficult on scientists as well. Um, so, uh, so it, it's a little more difficult. Um, and, and the question is sort of at what cost, right? You're you're trading in. Um, you don't have to build it yourself, but then you're you're reducing the the cycle time and and the turnaround time. So that's that's always the difficult trade off. Uh, clearly, clearly, you'd rather have it close by. Yeah, and and vivarium efficacy experiments, you know, there it, it, it's an art, not a science, right? There's certain skill sets that you need to actually have to get tumors to grow in animals, right? I mean, these are these are skills, right? If you look at other vivarium services like PK experiments, right? That's pretty simple to outsource, right? And it's also very cost effective to do it that way. But there are certain areas that you don't want to outsource, and those are the ones that require specialized skills. So the um, I want to add this wild card in here. Um, so the next step, obviously, we're we're very excited about the basic research and the um, the uh, small scale um, experimentation that's happening in all these labs and getting your products ready. Uh, the next step. Could be a big win for Connecticut if you begin to do some of your actually manufacturing and GMP work in this state itself. Um, are we set up for that? Or is that something you would be looking to do uh, once you um, start rolling into trials and stuff? Um, I think, um, Gene, you're sort of heading that way. How's your mm -hmm. experience? Well, we were we were very opportunistic, I have to say, and and um, and took advantage of the fact that there was a company in the space up in Groton um, in the incubator space that had GMP manufacturing had set it up. Uh, in fact, my head of manufacturing had worked there, so uh, we kind of grabbed that as soon as it became available. Even though at the time that we did, um, it was before we'd ever made the um, the corporate decision that we we're going to be changing manufacturing to that degree. We've now decided to continue and expand it. Um, so it was absolutely the right decision for us. And I think it's really going to be helping us. Now, you know, we have a little bit specialized needs as a lot of people do in that we're a microbiome company. So we're talking about manufacturing bacteria and there are um, more concerns than with a typical small molecule. So, you know, there's, there's certainly that opportunity, but, you know, I think that like us, you can do it on a small scale. You don't have to jump immediately to um, commercial scale manufacturing. And I think that that capability is certainly still here in the state. Scott, how about you? Are you your next? Are you thinking about manufacturing next too? Well, uh, I, I think um, you know. I think like like anything, it, it, you 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 sort of try to any of your skill sets, right? For a small company, you try to decide: is that something you want to bring in house? Or is that something you want to bring, uh, use a third party for? And, and sort of as a small company, I, I'm, I'm typically willing to pay a little bit of a premium for the flexibility to, to outsource um, wherever possible. It's just too difficult. We have, we have 22 people for, to bring in all the required resources. So it's the same, same thing on the vivarium side. We're not going to hire a, a vet, right? Um, so I, I think where we are at our, our, at our point in time, uh, we would look to outsource most of that um, manufacturing included. Um, you know, I, 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 from my prior experience at Alexion, you know, I think in the early days we started uh, down the same path. And then, but the time there, I, we spent a lot of time uh, bringing more and more in house just because we had the scale. Um, you know, we were going from 250 people to like 3,000 people um, by, the, by the time I left. So we were able to do it and it was much more of a dollars and cents skill set, controlling your own destiny, uh, you know, all the things that, that are involved that you'd much rather, you'd rather have it in-house controlling your own destiny for sure if you're able to scale. But as a small company, really, uh, for the most part, we're, we're trying to outsource anything that's sort of non-critical uh, non or, or where it's difficult to get the talent. Sean, how about you? What's your what's your thoughts on on manufacturing? 
Yeah, I can see how Genie would actually have uh, in-house manufacturing, right? There's some very specialized skill in the bi microbiome space, right? And there's almost know-how and IP that gets created there. Uh, we're in a bit of a different situation where we're a small molecule company. Uh, not that I want to uh, infer that there's any IP around the manufacturing process, but we, we right now um, are planning for scale of our compounds in the metric ton um, type size. So, um, you know, it really does make sense to just outsource that to certain, you know, high profile manufacturers that are out there. We right now, our supply chain um, between building blocks and, 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 uh, and drug product, you know, quite frankly, spans, I think, four continents right now. So, you know, trying to build that type of an infrastructure here in Connecticut, quite honestly, even the large pharma companies wouldn't do that. So we'll be in the outsource mode on, on manufacturing, um, particularly for our, for our later stage clinical trials. Now, there are some opportunities that we're looking at um, with respect to scale up activities on compounds that are coming out uh, of our discovery lab and going into GLP tox. That may make sense for us to do that. Um, and, and, you know, quite honestly, we've looked at and are considering, you know, some, some turnkey uh, facilities that just don't happen to not be in Connecticut at this time. So obviously that's a, a need we should be thinking about for our future, um, success here in the state. Yeah. Uh, it'd be nice to bring that level of, of, of uh, scale to our, to our, um, ecosystem here to have yep. it all right here, similar to Vivarium. Um, a few other uh, thoughts on uh, what our area might need uh, to continue to grow. Uh, Alyssa, do you have any uh, more thoughts there? No, I think it's mostly been covered. Okay, and all right. So, um, so I think that we've gotten through. Uh, I'm looking for any more questions here. So I think we've gotten to uh, the gist of them. Uh, I hope this has really been been very helpful for everybody. I know that um, I've learned a lot uh, talking with uh, all of our panelists here today, um, learning how their individual stories have um, they've been followed through the region, uh, overlapped with many of them, which is really great. Um, you know, being in this ecosystem for almost 30 years, uh, we've seen the our cluster here really really grow, grow, and I think at the moment. It's really at one of its, you know, best times and, and really exciting to see this. So um, I want to thank you, um, excuse me, everyone on the panel. Uh, thank you everyone for coming here on the panel. Uh, Gene, Alyssa, Scott, and Sean, I think you've all been, been wonderful uh, helping, uh, helping everybody here uh, understand uh, the issues we have facing us and also the, the good news that we've been addressing a lot of those issues. I've said it many times over the last few weeks while working with you guys, uh, what's good for each of you is good for all of us. And what you're doing to improve the lives of people all over the world is nothing really short of inspiring. Uh, I know it from my side, it's really that way. Uh, I hope we can continue to support each other uh, in this community and really be a role model for science communities everywhere. Uh, there are so many reasons uh, companies need to be drawn or are drawn to our area. It's vibrant, it's diverse, and I hope we're all seeing the excitement and growth of this development. Uh, so we at Spiegel's, and I think I could speak for BioCT as well, are happy to have met with you all over the last few weeks of these series of panels and are here as resources for you moving forward. Uh, we hope you've learned a lot. Uh, we plan to do this again next year, so please feel free to forward any comments or suggestions. Uh, thank you again. We're going to give you back about 10 minutes of your day to get, be, get to your next Zoom meeting. Um, so I hope to hear uh, from you. Hope to hear comments. And really, uh, this has really been great. And um, see you all around uh, into the community. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Thanks Eagles, Jay. for putting this together. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay.